by the time it's done, it's a, a, like an, as natural a forest as we can create. We are a living lab that can answer a lot of questions that are being raised when it comes to climate change internationally. The mangroves are real climate superheroes. We need to see restoration at scale. We're here today in a Nuf in Abu Dhabi, in the United Arab Emirates. With the Abu Dhabi Mangrove Initiative, or ADMI, that was launched in 2022, aims to work with local and international partners in order to facilitate research-based mangrove restoration. We are on the front lines when it comes to understanding and combating climate change. This is why it's very important to start the research here. And we have, in 2023 alone, managed to reach six million mangrove seedlings planted across Abu Dhabi. As you can see, there's an existing natural mangrove habitat. And our key priority, first and foremost, is to protect what naturally exists here and then enhance it with a bit of science-based restoration effort we're not trying to create new habitats, uh, replace existing natural habitats, or have large-scale afforestation areas. What we're trying to do is restore or enhance natural ecosystems in a science-based manner. This is a great example of various ecosystem services that these habitats provide, uh, mainly serving as fish nurseries. So you have a wide variety of juvenile fish. Some of them are commercially important fish species. We see gray herons, we see greater flamingos, we see stints, egrets as well. We also see a wide variety of invertebrates and gastropods, and these are cornerstones of, of the ecosystem functioning here and, and key indicators of a healthy uh, coastal site. So here we can see the nematophores, uh, and one thing that we look at uh, when selecting a suitable restoration site are the biophysical conditions at the site and primarily the soil conditions, um, but also the water quality, um, the water circulation, and the tidal inundation levels. And that will give us an indication of how successful the restoration project will be. One other thing that we look at is, of course, the natural, existing natural regeneration at the site. And here, right next to the mother tree, we see uh, a sapling that has about eight pairs of leaves. And this one would be about, let's say, two to three years old and it's the result of, a, of natural regeneration. So the seed naturally dropping, it would get stuck in the mud, and then the nematophores actually help the seed remain and not get washed away by the incoming tide. And that gives us a good indication that there's existing natural regeneration at the site, so the conditions are suitable, uh, and there's a potential for restoring or enhancing the mangrove ecosystems in this area. So when you think about traditional planting, you'll need a large number of people with nursery-grown seedlings to go out and plant them in different locations. And this creates a large footprint at the site from all these people being at the site planting. So one of the key advantages of, of drone technology is that it helps minimize also the environmental impact of restoration efforts because you can send it out and disperse a large number of seeds uh, in less time, so saving costs, but also minimizing the environmental impact and reaching less accessible areas. This is one of the drones that did the 2023 seeding season. This tank will hold 6,000 seeds approximately. The seeds range in size from maybe 20, 25 millimeters up to 40, 45 millimeters. This whole mechanism is custom designed for Abyssinia Marina. So we've got the tank, we've got the mechanism that feeds into the hopper, and when the seeds drop in, it shoots the seeds down so they get stuck in the mud. So that's a critical part of it. If the seeds don't get stuck into the mud, then when the tide goes in and out, they'll roll around, they'll get pushed up on the shore, they'll get drugged back out to sea. We use remote sensing, but also drone imagery to identify 
where we want to disperse the seeds and where we want to avoid dispersing the seeds uh, to avoid encroaching on other important uh, coastal habitats. Everything is autonomous. The drone planting patterns, all based on nature. So we don't plant in straight lines. We don't plant in any of the pools or any of the channels. And then the system takes into account the trees that are already there to shut the system off and on. So it's, it's all planted only in the areas with the highest probability of growth. By the time it's done, it's a, a, like an, as natural a forest as we can create. So we have everything geo-referenced, so we can say each of these plots has approximately 6,000 seeds. So when we do our monitoring, we know exactly how many are supposed to be growing in there. And we also monitor where the seeds came from, how long they were stored, and what day they were dropped on. So then we can take all of that data and identify if certain areas seeds were healthier than other areas of seeds, or um, if there's a block that had a lower survival rate, we can see like, did that have to do with tides or currents or some sort of algae? So this is one example of a young seedling that's growing that's been planted about seven to eight months ago. They've germinated successfully and they're growing well, but really it takes years uh, of monitoring before we can conclude that we've successfully restored the site. We also look at the water flow. We keep an eye on the temperature because everything will affect the growth of these mangroves. I mean, here we have an extreme environment. We have an environment that is highly saline, uh, very warm, uh, especially during the summer conditions. And you have species and, and habitats that are surviving at the threshold of their tolerance. It's a unique ecosystem that has its, its local values, but also global values in terms of carbon sequestration, uh, and of course, incredibly important for local biodiversity. So what happens here will advise the scenarios that will happen elsewhere. We are a living lab that can answer a lot of questions that are being raised when it comes to climate change internationally. And we are a window to what to expect internationally when the temperatures continue rising. Mangroves are real climate superheroes. There's about 147,000 square kilometers of mangroves left in the world, but they store billions of tons of carbon dioxide. They're the most efficient carbon capture and storage system in the world. But they have been under heavy historic pressure. Many of our mangroves have been cut and cleared, turned into things like aquaculture ponds for farming of fish. And so we've lost a lot of that primary biodiversity. And we really wanted to work with colleagues in the UAE to get that knowledge and support out to the ground level in the most biodiverse, rich places of the world. But these are also desperately poor places of the world that need a lot of support with um, habitat protection and restoration. What makes nature a more attractive solution is because it does not give you just one service, because it's going to be a carbon sink. It's going to save your coast from erosion. It could also work as fisheries nursery. So that's why they're more attractive than any other solution. We need to see restoration at scale. That means that we need to see policies taken towards local economic development, food production, land development, not contradict efforts to meet the challenge of climate change. They have to work hand in hand. Understanding the situation here will help globally put mitigation plans that will limit the effects of climate change. There are huge steps forward when it comes to research. And to be honest, there's a lot more that could and should be done when it comes to mangroves.